Okay, so uh, going through just uh, chronologically the, the life of Christ, I looked at uh, Peter's confession last week, looked at uh, uh, Jesus for telling his death and resurrection. So I want us to, to start with um, the transfiguration, looking in Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. Uh, so we're going to look at the, the transfiguration, talk about the apostles not being able to cast out demons. Uh, there is another time, a second time, when Jesus starts foretelling his death and resurrection as well. But Matthew chapter 17, a couple of things to note here. Just uh, Does anyone want to read uh, Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 13, or part of it, and then someone else pick up? Don't everybody jump at After once. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and left him up a high, left him up a high mountain by himself. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Peter. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, <coughs> it is good for us to meet you. Is anyone? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were much afraid. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the virgin to no one the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them and John the ba about John the Baptist. Okay. Thank you. You very much for reading. I'm not sure where Pam went to. Um, so, uh, you know, in looking at this, uh, this first area of the transfiguration, a, a couple of interesting things. Um, you know, we have this that he's taken Peter, James, and, and John up to, the, up to this mountain. So it's just the four of them there, and he is transfigured in, in front of them. But interestingly is that Moses and Elijah, um, just uh, they appear next to Christ. Now, if we look back just, you know, in the previous chapter, uh, we have Peter's confession of Christ, right? And, and what were the people saying uh, as far as Jesus is concerned as to who he might be? Uh, yeah, is, is that we have there... Um, in, um, in verse 14, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Moses, uh, he was also a, a prophet. He's the, first, uh, he's the first lawgiver. So when we consider this, is there now any mistake that Jesus is not Elijah? Well, yeah, they're together. Right. So, I, I mean, the people can't mistake Christ for Elijah because here we have them standing next to each other in this and they can't uh, they can't mistake christ for moses either and he says there in uh, in verse five this is my beloved son in whom i have well pleased listen uh, to him now where have we heard that before absolutely his baptism there in john or uh, sorry matthew chapter three 
And verse 17, behold, the voice out of heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am, I am well pleased. Have you ever noticed that God never says that he's proud? He's it, yeah, he's pleased or he's well pleased. God never mentions, uh, you know, or says that he is proud in scripture. What, why might there be a reason for that? What does the Bible say about pride? Yeah. Pride comes before destruction, an arrogant spirit before the fall. And so if God were to sit there and start talking about being proud, then that could lead some people to question that. It's, um, we, or, or question the, question the, uh, the validity of God. Now, in thinking about that, here we have Christ, his only begotten son. Um, I, I'm not necessarily fond of uh, translations that take out the word begotten uh, or uh, am to where it just says this is his only son. Uh, but, uh, and mainly, it's not that it's unscriptural or anything. Um, the word begotten is in there, but it can lead to so, some confusion because later on in the New Testament, Christians are referred to you know, as sons and daughters. So some people who don't study their Bible, they might look and say, well, it just says that Jesus was God's only son, and now you have Paul over here saying that we're sons and daughters. So kind of which is it, right? Um, we are all created in the image of God, one, uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Uh, talking about that spirit of God, obviously not the, the physical being of God. But, um, but so we have that he is well pleased and that he's the one that people should be, uh, should be listening to. Um, also, if we look over, you know, how some people may have been thinking that uh, Jesus, John, being John the Baptist, right? Peter's confession, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, you know, Elijah and what have you. Um, because John, having been killed uh, a couple of previous chapters before, we also have Elijah, who was taken up. We, we don't have that. We don't have the record of Christ, or sorry, Jeremiah's death. And, and so there could have been a lot of people that they were saying that Jesus was. So we, we can go ahead and we can take out, you know, Elijah, because Elijah is standing there. But in... Uh, Matthew he's, has that question, you know, in verse 10, his disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is come and will restore all things. But I say to you, Elijah already came and they did not recognize him. Now, just in, in thinking a, about that, you know, we have obviously that Elijah has come but then look over at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. So we have, obviously, the prophet Elijah in, uh, I'll say the classical Old Testament. We're, we're, even though we're in the gospel accounts here, it's still before the cross, so technically we're still in the Old Testament. Uh, but the, what we refer to is the classic Old Testament, you know, everything before Matthew. So we know that Elijah is there. But then we have in John chapter 1, this testimony of John beginning in verse 19 and it says this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him who are you and he confessed and did not deny but confessed I am not the Christ they asked him what then are you Elijah he said no I'm not are you the prophet and he answered no when Christ is sitting here talking about Elijah has already come there's really two things that he's alluding to one, the prophet Elijah, but the, the second thing he is alluding to is one who came in the spirit of Elijah, which would be John. So Elijah has come, he's already come, and, and they didn't recognize him. Most commentators will tend to, to, tend to say that he's leaning more towards talking about John and being in the spirit of Elijah because John was there during this particular time, Elijah being, you know, uh, well, a while back, a few hundred years, you know, uh, a while back. And so John, he was a contemporary of them. They, they were able to question him. 
uh, they, you know, Herod had him killed. And so they would have recognized that. So Elijah has come. Elijah is come. And, uh, but they didn't recognize him. What was the responsibility uh, of John? Right. He's the forerunner. He's to prepare the way, make ready the way of the Lord. Uh, when we look at the idea of making ready, any time a king was traveling somewhere, they actually had not only the guards with them, but they had people who would generally go a mile or two miles out in front of them to clear any boulders and trees and all of this out of the way. They were making ready the way of the king. And that's what John was doing spiritually in that he was speaking what? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then after Christ, he's baptized. After he's baptized, you, we have there the, the Trinity on display where uh, we have the, the Son, we have the voice uh, of the Father there speaking, and then we have the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descending on, on him. So we've got the Trinity, and then he goes in, into the wilderness 40 days, 40 nights, where he is tested, and uh, where he fasts, and he prays, and he's tested, and he's led out, and the first thing that he starts preaching is what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's the same message. The message of God has not changed at all. It, didn't, it had, hadn't changed from the Old Testament going through the Bible. Uh, it's all about repentance. It's all about you know, getting back to God. And uh, there, in this, there's a couple of things there regarding kingdom. Kingdom is used interchangeably in the New Testament. Uh, sometimes it references the church. Um, sometimes it references heaven, the, uh, the eternal kingdom. So we've got to look at the context there. So when they're speaking, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, uh, most scholars and, and those that we refer to as the early church fathers, those who were uh, closer to the time period of Christ and, and what have you, um, and there's around... I think 20, 20 to 25 different volumes of texts uh, that are written by these quote-unquote early church fathers. Most tend to believe that the repent for the kingdom of, it, of heaven is at hand it is not necessarily talking about the eternal kingdom, but it is at hand when the old law is about to be done away with. Something new is about to be established. You need to repent for the Lord's church is at hand. He, he is about to do away. This old law is going to be nailed to the cross. Now, obviously, they're not speaking in those terms. Jesus was speaking. Jesus spoke in parables. We don't really have, a, you know, any of, any of John's teaching, uh, but that he spoke in parables so that they would have to discern. Their ears were not uh, unplugged or unclogged. Their eyes were not open. And But G Jesus did say, look, there's a time when I'm not going to speak in parables, and, and we know that he tells his disciples plainly. Uh, any thoughts or, or comments so far or questions? Okay, then. Um, we won't read uh, the other couple of references um, there. Uh, if you're taking notes, though, and you didn't get them last week, uh, Mark chapter 9 verses 2 through 13 mark chapter 9 verses 2 through 13 we won't read them just for time and then the other one was luke chapter 9 verse 28 through 36 but a uh, couple of other things to mention here so mark chapter 9 2 through 13 and then luke 9 28 to 36 but you know um You know, he is, or, you know, this voice out of a cloud, this my beloved son, they fell down on their face to the ground and, and they were terrified. A lot of people wonder what the voice of God sounds like, you know, audibly sounds like, right? Um, you'll have people today who the Lord spoke to me, right? that type of thing. Uh, we know that God does, does not do that. Um, we are cessationists, so the age of miracles in, in the biblical sense is gone. But what did God's voice 
sound like it in the Bible that it would terrify uh, people uh, so much? Well, really, it's described a, a couple of different ways. Psalm 29 Psalm 29 talks about the voice of God really being like thunder. Psalm 29 and verse 4, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. Uh, and, and it is a strong voice. It's a powerful voice. We think of Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 and verses 18 and 19. You know, we have Moses. He, he's up on the mount. He's, he's receiving the law. If we remember the scene there, there's, uh, it, you know, the mountain is covered with, with clouds and thunder and lightning and, and all of this. But there in Exodus 20 and verse 19, the voice of God has put such fear in the people that there in uh, verses 18 and 19, I believe it's 18 and 19. Let me double check before I start going off. Uh, yeah, all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we'll listen, but let not God speak to us or we will all die. So there is a, a great majesty, a, a, the sound of thunder. And, and this is not something that isn't understood because they're hearing the words Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. You know, just imagine maybe the last big storm that we had, right? And then just imagine that instead of just that rumbling thunder and that's it, or that, that big thunder that you hear, imagine something of that magnitude speaking to you from a cloud. Right? We're not seeing a face here. They've got, they've got Elijah in them there but, and Moses there. But this voice is coming from a cloud. Could you imagine? You're up, the weathermen tell us now that we shouldn't go outside when there's a lot of lightning and thunder unless we want to end up being a crispy critter, right? We don't do that. So imagine that Jesus has led you up on a mountain. So now you're closer up there. And then all of a sudden... This cloud is there with this booming voice like thunder, and it speaks to you. Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. I would have fell on my face and, and tried crawling down the mountain if that happened to me, if I'm just being honest, you know. Yes, there are times when, when the Bible talks about, you know, God's voice being like a whisper. It's, it's really dependent uh, on what the occasion is. But most of the time, it, it is described as this loud, booming voice. There is something there that, uh, that causes and strikes fear in people, and, and it's... I find that very interesting. Uh, you know, we're called throughout Scripture to have a healthy fear of the Lord, a, a reverence for God, right? And one of the ways that's displayed is in hearing the voice of, of God. Now, we, we hear that through Scripture. It speaks volumes uh, through Scripture. Let me see here, Job 37. Um, Job 37, uh, verse 4, it says, He thunders with his majestic voice, and he does not restrain the lightnings, the lightnings when his voice is heard. God thunders with his voice wondrously. That's Job 37, verses 4 and 
Well, there's verses 4 through 14. We also have here in First, First Kings chapter 19. I should have brought my glasses. First Kings chapter 19, we have the prophet Elijah, coincidentally, um, there at Horeb. Beginning in verse 9 of 1 Kings 19, Then he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So he said, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great strong wind was uh, rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after, after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Cave. And then there's that question again. Behold, the voice came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? The voice of God is really dependent on the occasion and what needs to be spoken. We have, as we've read throughout scripture, where it's this loud, this thunderous voice that just strikes fear in people to where they drop down on their knees. If we were to look at Isaiah chapter one, it's got, we have that uh, the prophet there, he saw God, the train of his robe filling the temple. It says he fell down as a dead man. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, John exiled to Patmos. That he is, it says, taken in the spirit, you know, on the Lord's day. And he saw the heavenly host and he fell down like a dead man. But then we also have an occasion like this where there's Elijah and he feels persecuted. He feels like he's the only one left. Would it have done him any good to hear this loud, thunderous voice? Probably would have made him feel worse about the situation. Almost like a, uh, maybe an innocent child and their parent, you know, just starts talking really loudly to them. That'll happen sometimes. You know, Austin can do something and... It, it, I won't think it's a big deal at all. You know, it won't be a big deal at all. But I talk loud. Rachel's always telling me, talk down, down. You know, you, know, you need to be a here. Your voice isn't a here. That's just because I normally talk loud. And sometimes when I'm doing that around Austin, he'll say, well, you seem like you're mad at me. Like, no, I'm not mad. I just talk loud. You know, so I can imagine this situation here of Elijah and this booming voice comes out, uh, you know, that why is God mad at me? I'm the only one that's left. I'm the one that's zealous and, and what have you. But he says, no, that's not what's necessary. Now, how do we want to translate that, though, to, to us today? Sometimes, you know, we don't have the audible voice of God, Right. Uh, that we don't have that now. What we do have is God speaking to us through his word. And sometimes through God's word, it will smack us in the face like a loud booming voice about uh, maybe something that we're struggling with, a sin in our life, what have you. Right? But if you just think back to your own reading of the Bible, right? If there's been a sin that you're guilty of, and when I, I'm talking about the, this guilt of sin, I'm talking that it, you are blatantly doing it. You know that it's a sin, you don't care, right? Okay, so uh, maybe you've had that, maybe you haven't. But if you, and please don't raise your hands, and please don't raise anybody else's hands for them. Don't point to anybody, you know. But you just think about that, and oftentimes the person who is blatantly in sin, that's when God's voice is the loudest, if you've ever noticed that. 
It, it, even even I, I've noticed it in my own life. There's, I, you know, I'm not perfect. There are things that I've done. I know that they're wrong, but I've done them anyways or what have you. And then it's like freight train. God's, you know, you're reading God's word and it just hits you. And it's loud. And it just exposes everything. It's like that light that's come into the world, John says. And it exposes the darkness. The darkness can't hide from it. But then have you also noticed on the other side that maybe... It, you're just struggling with something. You know, it's not maybe a blatant sin. There's just something going on that you're not sure to handle or a person you're not sure how to deal with, whatever the case may be. And God's voice is a little bit quieter in his word. You ever notice that? If you haven't, then try as you're reading, you know, to, to, he, to hear, you know, through the word, the tone of God's voice. Because it didn't even change with his earthly ministry either. When, when Jesus came into the world, how he responded to the quote-unquote religious elite was vastly different to how he responded to other people. We have self-righteous Pharisees, for example. What did Jesus say? You brood of vipers, hypocrites, whitewashed tombs. He had no tolerance for it. But then we see a Pharisee who's sincere in John chapter 3, Nicodemus. And he's very open with him. And he talks to him. He's not calling him a hypocrite. He's not calling him a liar. He's not calling him, you know, a brood of vipers. And forgive me, that was, that was John, not Jesus. But um, he's not doing any of that. But he's sincere. When he sits there and the woman who is pulled out you know, the quote-unquote adulterous woman, and she's about to be stoned. He, he leans down to her. He's not calling her a hypocrite or anything like that. God, so God's response is it's dependent on the situation. So just kind of pointing that out, because we're, we're listening or we're reading this, and we have this confession, this voice calling out, and they fall down, they're afraid. So just maybe as you're going through your daily Bible reading, try to, and, and this is the only way that I can really think to put it, but try to listen to God's voice. How is, God, how is the word of God speaking in that moment? Because the way that we perceive how God is speaking also depends on the relationship going forward. If, and I'll try to smooth that out a little bit. If you're, let's say you're struggling with something, right? We all struggle. You're struggling with something. It's not a sin that you're just blatantly doing. It's, it's a thorn in the flesh, Okay but you're struggling with something and you read a, a piece of scripture that really speaks to what's going on in your life at that moment. Maybe it's how you're to respond to the situation. Maybe it's how, you know, to get out of the situation, whatever the case may be, right? If you perceive that scripture as being loud and forceful, you're going to take that with a different mindset than you would have of a counselor, uh, of encouragement, of a father kind of, you know, looking after his child. When we hear the loud, boom, booming voice, a lot of the times we want to reject that. We want to cover our ears, you know, and, and, and that type of thing. Thoughts, comments? Yes, ma'am. Mm. Whether the the calm voice, the calmness in our struggles, are to convict us when we're doing things that are correct. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, great point. Um, if you didn't get the reference, it was Hebrews four twelve. You know, it's living, it's active. You know, it fluctuates. Have you ever known a father to always be mad at their child, always to yell at their kid, on every single moment? 
I'm not talking about occasionally. I'm not talking about they had a bad temper every now and then. I'm talking every time they opened their mouth to their child, they were yelling at them. No, of course not. God's no different in that sense. Right? Um, in fact, we want to go ahead and turn over to Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, maybe it's not chapter 1. It's been one of those days already. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6. I apologize. I think I said Isaiah chapter 1 before, too. What I meant to say was... I, I, Sometimes I'll, you know, dyslexia sometimes gets the better of me. And I was thinking Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, but it's actually Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. So, you know. Hey, just be thankful that I don't, uh, that I don't read the Bible backwards. Otherwise, I might sound like an old Led Zeppelin song. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven." So it's been mentioned before there in verse 3 where it's saying holy, 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 and it repeats it. It's taking it to the superlative. So it's saying that God is holy, he is holier, and he is holiest, okay, uh, of all things. But just his voice there, his voice that, that it's trembling, the foundations of the threshold. Now what is this vision that he's having? He's having a vision of, of God in heaven. The, the veil has parted, and he is seeing a vision in heaven where God's voice shakes the very foundations of even heaven, right? And, and he, he, he drops down and his woe is me, I am ruined. He hears his voice. And, and it's just this... It's this loud, booming voice. But then the angel comes to him with this hot coal and he puts it on his lips. And he says, but your sin is forgiven. Could you imagine, though, if the, the voice were different in saying that? If it were this loud, booming, your sin is forgiven. That really doesn't sound like a forgiving tone, necessarily, does it? You know, people are going to be mad at me for that one. Someone's going to be watching that on YouTube, not paying attention to their TV, and then all of a sudden the volume goes up. But no, instead it's, your sin is forgiven. Definite difference in the way that God responds to his people. But we have to be open to that. If we're not open to the way that God responds, you know, sometimes it's going to, it's going to be that soft, that calm voice, that still voice, Right? that's leading us beside still waters, you know? But if we're not paying attention to it, what happens? If, you're, if you tell your kids to clean the room, or a grandchild or whatever, to clean the room, you're calm about it, hey, I need you to go clean your room. Hour later, still watching TV or something like that, I need you to go clean your room. A couple hours later, still not doing it. I need you to go clean your room. 
Two days later, it's still not done. Boy, you better, you better pray to God, okay? Because I'm coming after you now, right? If we're not paying attention to the way that God is talking, that still small voice, it can get louder and louder and louder until we're the ones covering our ears on our knees, crying out, please forgive me, right? Thoughts, comments? Questions, complaints? Yes. You know, going back to Hebrews 4, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when you read through the Bible, uh, there are verses that just make you want to stop and be so thankful. And in verse 15, it says about uh, Jesus, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. So as we, as we uh, are challenged to live the life we want to live, it's a comfort to know as we struggle that Jesus understands our weaknesses. And yet at the same time, you know, um, the Bible tells us to be, be still and listen. So I think sometimes when we can't be still and we're just buzzing around, Maybe that louder volume is necessary to get our attention. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Be still and know that I am God. In the Old Testament, and I can't remember the reference offhand, uh, I believe it's somewhere in Exodus, maybe 17, um, but it says, uh, the Lord will fight for you. You hold your peace. In fact, it says the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. If, as Sherry was saying, if, if, we, if we're just still and we just pay attention, you know, God will fight for us. You know, and, and he's there for us. But we absolutely have to be paying attention to that. Any other thoughts or comments? Um... Yeah, and when we finish up James chapter 1, uh, you know, we're going to take a break for a couple of weeks before we get into chapter 2 for the, for the sermon and, and everything. We're going to look at praying and praying big and talk about our prayer life and, and, and how to, to try to listen to the voice of God more. Uh, next week, you know, I thought I was going to get to it this week, but, you know, that y'all know me. Um, it's like the John class all over again. Uh, we'll look at casting out demons, uh, Jesus telling of his death, uh, money from a fish, and, uh, you know, how no one likes the IRS. But thank you all very much.